Yeah, thank you. So I'm just going to do a three-minute intro on why we created the program and, and uh, how it's going so far, and then hand it off to do a lot more details. Uh, CNCF is three and a half years old. In that time, I think the most impactful program that CNCF has created for the cloud native community is certified Kubernetes. And so this is a way of certifying that every uh, implementation of Kubernetes out there supports all of the necessary APIs. And so uh, if you have a workload that runs on one version, it really should run uh, correctly on another. Now, in the real world, it, uh, our conformance tests do not yet support 100% or cover 100% of APIs, and even on covering 100%, there's then uh, a lot of subtleties about how we're exercising and such. And so it is a program that continues to improve and that we make significant investments into. But um, I would actually compare us against uh, some of the most successful certification programs ever, say Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or uh, Android applications as, as being three, and the fact that we've gotten the entire industry, so all of the biggest public clouds, smallest public clouds, all of the distributions that were not uh, just getting a part of it, uh, has really exceeded our kind of wildest dreams when we launched this program uh, just a year and a half ago. So uh, we're up to something like 89 or 90 uh, certified Kubernetes implementations. It's um, uh, all on our website. We have this logo that you get to use. One of the big carrots that we offer is that if you want to use the term Kubernetes in your product name, like Google Kubernetes Engine, or uh, uh, I think it's like canonical distribution of Kubernetes, uh, you need to be certified Kubernetes. So the, the fact that we own the trademark and are then able to offer that usage of it is uh, has encouraged a lot of people to make use of it. We divide the certified Kubernetes implementations into three groups. Uh, it's the uh, distributions up top, meaning that you can install it yourself uh, and you can see all the different vendors uh, that we have here. And then we have the hosted and so these are uh, the clouds, uh, and you can see Baidu there, and uh, Huawei, and Alibaba, and others. And then um, the finally we have it, the installers. And we just define this as saying that they're not really adding any other software. It's all about just taking vanilla Kubernetes and as a way of um, building it in. One uh, nice thing here you can see in the latest Kubernetes just released uh, this week, KubeADM has a logo now, which it uh, didn't have before. Uh, interestingly, there's five different installers built into Kubernetes uh, that are uh, COPS, KubeSpray, KubeADM, Minikube, and Kind. Um, and it just speaks to the fact that this is a very big project. People have different approaches to doing it, but we're really pleased that all five of those are certified Kubernetes, that it's, uh, it speaks to that level of interoperability and, uh, and compatibility. So um, we continue to make significant investments in the underlying conformance tests. The program itself for certified Kubernetes uh, really runs quite smoothly, and we can talk through that, but it's, it's all public on GitHub. Uh, it is free for members and for nonprofit organizations. And uh, we've had a huge uptake of it here in China, um, over 25% over of all of our certified Kubernetes uh, implementations are from China. So I will hand it off there. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, Dan has uh, kindly found some time to come and give us a brief update on this. Um, I will walk through what Kubernetes Confounds program is. Um, from the certification point of view. And also, this is an intro and deep dive together in 35 minutes. So it's going to be uh, a little bit of what, from the community perspective, uh, work from the community side of things. So on the development of the ETE tests and uh, approaches. So, so Kubernetes, certified Kubernetes is a software conformance program, like we all know. Uh, vendors can choose to certify their uh, offering uh, with CNCF. 
And uh, this program has started in 2017. And now, like Dan said, there are more than 80 uh, vendors who are certified um, on the program. So um, what does it mean? I mean, uh, CNCF, of course, runs the uh, Kubernetes certified program. But um, the, the importance is that most of the world's leading enterprise software companies um, are, are now um, providing Kubernetes on their offerings, and they are certified. That's the great part about this program. Um, any vendor is invited to to have um, um, certification, and uh, they just have to follow a certain uh, ways to um, submit the results um, by by running tools. I'll, I'll I'll talk about these tools. And uh, coverage-wise, uh, we are trying to uh, we are trying to make sure that enough of coverage is done so that. Um, it is. Uh, um, it makes um, real value to the offering. Um, so, um, actual software conformance um, um, on the vendor version uh, requires them to exercise certain APIs. Uh, the the APIs that are exercised by the free version of uh, Kubernetes, the community version of the Kubernetes, right? So th that way we'll ensure that there is consistency and the portability. So if you, are, uh, if you run your workload, you can run your workload anywhere and everywhere. Um, so uh, so uh, in order to, uh, to not have vendor lock-in, um, it's, it's important that um, uh, you run your workloads on certified Kubernetes platforms. And from the provider point of view, they have to have timely updates on the conformance program. Um, they have to certify latest versions of Kubernetes. Um, and uh, I'll talk about uh, how that works. Um, so like Dan mentioned, certified Kubernetes marks and uh, Kubernetes mark are uh, trademarks of Linux Foundation. So uh, Linux established this for a reason. Uh, number one, it's, uh, it provides a quality of the service that is offered by the vendor. And uh, so that it ensures that the community members are able to accurately describe that um, offering. Um, it is very easy to, uh, to actually um, um, to participate in the program um, by self-testing um, on the qualifying offering. And the CNCF uh, has a participation form, which is a, a set of questions that you, general questions that you answer. Uh, and then with the self-tested results and this form, you submit as a PR to their uh, GitHub repo. That way, um, CNCF will be able to verify your results and uh, validate those results and certify you. And the program is not free uh, for um, it's uh, it's free for the CNCF members as well as nonprofit organizations. There may be, uh, there is uh, some fee associated with it, and uh, all the terms and conditions of the program are listed on the CNCF website. I'll, I'll show that to you. In order to be eligible um, certified Kubernetes, you need to be certified on one of the latest two minor releases. For example, 113 or 114. I know that 115 is released last week. Um, say, for example, um, um, the certification is valid for 12 months. Um, and then if you're, for example, you're certified on 17 on June 30th, 2017, right? And a year later, on June 30th, 2018, there are two more versions available for you, 111 and 110. You need to be certified on 110 or 111 to remain certified. Um, and the terms and conditions here um, actually 
are part of the CNCF website that uh, we browsed uh, before. Um, so you can actually, if you ha have access to my slides, uh, you should be able to get to those. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to go through that. Um, so there are two ways to run the test. Um, either you, you use kubetest to run the test, or use the Sunoboy, uh, which is a tool available. And I'll walk uh, through Sunoboy um, in detail. But if you are using kubetest locally, uh, you're building the, the ETE tests on your, on your cluster. Oh, sorry. And then you, you, access, you set the access path to the, your cluster and run the test with uh, Ginkgo Focus on to confirm it. So there are lots of ETE tests, like uh, about 2,000 ETE tests in the, in the KK, right? And uh, conformance tests are a, a small subset, which is like 200 tests right now. We're constantly adding new tests to the conformance program, but uh, it takes a long time to add tests to the conformance program. I'll explain also why it takes a long time, but. Uh, generally, uh, it's a small subtest uh, which uh, is hitting the core API of Kubernetes. Uh, so the other option is to run Sonobuyi. Uh, for this, you stand up a cluster on any platform, any offering you have. Um, you need a kube control installed, uh, the client, and. Uh, access to the cluster by proper kube config. And you need to download the Sonobuyi uh, program, return and go. And uh, originally, this tool was available from Heptio. Now it's, uh, um, it's managed by the community. So um, actually, I ran this um, a while ago, if you can. Um, Uh, can you see my screen? So on IBM Cloud, um, so essentially, um, IBM Cloud, I created a cluster of three nodes. And I exported kube config so I can reach to the cluster. And uh, I did a go get on Sonobuyi. I think I did somewhere here, but uh, assume that I got it. And then just as soon as we run, um, and then you monitor the tests are run. Uh, after a while, uh, you will notice that um, uh, Sonobuy run has uh, completed, and uh, then you would do a, sorry, I think I'm on the wrong window here. So uh, it's run uh, if you, If you see, Sonobuyi runs a, a set of pods on your cluster. Um, and running inside these uh, pods, the ETE tests. And uh, eventually, when it finishes, uh, by checking the Sonobuyi status, it's complete. You can go ahead and uh, do a Sonobuyi retrieve. What it does is it captures all the test output from, from your cluster and dumps it into a tar file. Using that tar file, um, you can, these are all the contents of the tar file, which uh, probably have not much interest for us. I, I expanded the tar file into a directory, and then you can do tail minus 20f um, on, the, on the cluster itself, and you can see um, all the tests passed. So you submit this result back to uh, CNCF along with the with other forms. Uh, it's clearly indicated on the CNCF website as a PR. Um, so uh, as you can see, a lot of vendors submitting PRs to the GitHub repo. Um, 
if you look at the, any other PRs, for example, IBM has submitted this PR here. Uh, it has all the artifacts required by the CNCF. And once CNCF verifies this, um, uh, the form and the version that you are testing against, in this case, is 110. And then um, um, the version of the cube control, which gives you the version of the client as well as the server. All the artifacts are submitted along with the ETE log. Um, that can be used to certify the I'm not sure what's good. Ah. Yeah, it's on the, the other side of the plus minus. Yeah. That one. Ah. Okay. You can tell the Google slide user. <laughs> so uh, that is uh, briefly about the the CNCF side of things. Uh, how you certify your um, version of Kubernetes so that you can use um, uh, one of these cool logos like certified Kubernetes. Um, from the community point of view, I want to give a brief update uh, what we are doing. Um, Could you just make that distinction of what CNCS is responsible for and what SIG testing and SIG are yeah, um, well, from the uh, CNCF side, it, they are managing the conformance program uh, from the certification point of view on the, cl uh, on the vendors on the client side, right? On the community side, what we are trying to do is how can we build the conformance um, program itself? Uh, how do we make sure that all the vendors have the same quality of service? Uh, essentially, the, uh, the role is uh, SIG architecture is, is the umbrella uh, for governing this from the community point of view. They decide uh, what all the required tests that should be run as part of the conformance. And uh, we have a, a conformance sub-project uh, where we have um, development activity that uh, will go through and uh, um, communicate with other six in uh, Kubernetes. There are lots of six that are involved in, in, into the ETA test. Um, and uh, define the behaviors of the tests. And the six are responsible for writing the ETA test, right? I mean, we are conformance program. We do not have the necessary skills for all the associated um, uh, SIG-related work. So uh, six will write the ETE test, and the ETE test will become part of the ETE suite. And from the conformance point of view, we will then go ahead and promote an existing ETE test into conformance test suite. So this is always happening. So from every release to the next release, there will be more conformance tests that gets added to the test suite. So. Uh, it's not as, as static as we think. So once you pass the conformance, it doesn't mean that you will pass the conformance for the next uh, um, release and so on and so forth, because there are more tests and more tests right now. I think we have about 200 and over 210 right now. Uh, the one I showed you was for uh, version 113, where we had about 190 tests. So there are like 20, 25 tests I added between 113 and 115. Um, so there are several approaches we take from the community point of view. Uh, first, we decided that we will concentrate on path spec because that's a general thing that should work consistently for all the workloads. Uh, we have exercised most part of the path spec, but there are still there are some areas of the path spec that are not exercised yet, so we are working on it. Uh, like I said, the promotion process itself takes several cycles. So we, we decide that this particular feature is not tested, like pod to pod communication within a cluster is not tested. We write a U2E test in this 
quarter uh, in this release, we, we add that to the ETE test suite. We make sure that the test is not flaky and not slow and so on and so forth. I've co the test has been consistent on our CI. In the next release, that test will be slated to, to promotion to conformance test. So what is promoted to conformance test are guaranteed to work well. That's a uh, so a couple of ideas for us. Uh, so at this point, we're not 100% covered, uh, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. So uh, we have only 200 tests, uh, and we want to improve the coverage so of the core features of Kubernetes. So there are several approaches we are taking. Uh, a couple of approaches I mentioned here is behavioral-driven uh, conformance testing. Uh, what in this case we are trying to do is uh, we're trying to uh, look at the API and the fields and, and see how they can be used in user scenarios and define the behaviors and then we go ahead and write new ETE tests. Uh, the other approach that uh, there is a tool called API Snoop uh, which basically analyzes the audit logs uh, every time you run some tests or workload whatever you run on the cluster and sees what all the API endpoints you're hitting. So if you are not hitting some API endpoints during the conformance test uh, tests that are run on the cluster, we know these APIs, which are the core APIs, that needs to be hit. So that means we need to write more tests in those areas. So there, these are the two approaches we are following. And then there is also a validation suites proposal right now uh, uh, that's uh, in the works. Um, this is more not towards the conformance program itself, but it is for things that are outside of the conformance program. Like, for example, you have functionality like um, CSI drivers and storage. Uh, that's not part of the core feature. So we need some kind of a suite that can only test that particular module or networking CNI or not, right? So uh, that's the idea uh, in there. So these are... Um, Again, uh, very pu uh, public uh, information. So if you um, if you want to see, this is a cap that is uh, outstanding. You can you can actually participate and uh, discuss on this cap uh, the idea behind how we are going to do behavioral testing. Uh, similarly, API Snoop is uh, is also something that you can see what all the APIs that are uh, that are running right now. Um, um, uh, the, on the CI uh, and see the coverage there. So, about the conformance tests, ETE tests itself, like I mentioned briefly here and there, but uh, um, the merging process of any ETE test is a SIG responsibility. Like, for example, if it's a networking test, SIG networking. If it's a node test, it's SIG node. And eventually, they, uh, we analyze that and say, oh, this can be promoted to conformance. It takes two releases. The, co the main idea, uh, the, the criteria that the conformance test has to meet is it should be a GA feature. It cannot be an alpha or beta feature. Mm -hmm. And it should work on all providers and on all architectures. It cannot rely on network or binaries, special binaries. So. What we are expecting is any Kubernetes vendor should not have to do additional steps to run this. And it has to be stable and consistent. That's why we have two, two release cycles associated with it. Um, so there are two PRs. One is to add the ETE, and the second PR would be to add that test to the conformance test suite. So a promotion PR has to be done to get the test into, um, into the suite. There are other, oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Wow. So that's what I talked about here. So um, essentially, um, that's the criteria for the conformance test suites. So eventually, if you are promoting an E2E, you should submit a uh, PR to the SIG architecture. There are areas that we want to cover um, in the con 
in the conformance test suite, those are the areas that um, needs to be covered. Uh, especially node pod, we are covering pod right now. Um, volumes, there are tests already existing, but there are more tests needs to be written. So we are ma man monitoring how much percentage of coverage we have, and there's a lot of work needs to be done still. And uh, while promoting the conformance test, you also have to document the test properly, and um, each test will have a documentation header on top of the test, which lists uh, when the test is added to a release and when the test is modified, and um, a very high-level description of the test, which will help us uh, to identify what area is covered and what the test actually does. So uh, vendors who are running the conformance test, they need not have to know the technical details of the test. They don't have to go through the code, but they will know exactly what the test is doing. Uh, it helps us uh, to actually analyze based on the metadata that we are adding at the top of the test, uh, what the coverage is, and uh, also debug if something goes wrong and fails in a vendor environment, right? So um, the documentation looks something like this. So you'll have um, test um, description and then um, on the link, the blue part is the link to actual source code uh, of, the, of the test. Um, about the, uh, from the community point of view, the Kubernetes conformance program, uh, we have a, a Kubernetes conformance work group it's not a SIG, it's a work group. And there's a mailing list. If you have any questions about the conformance program, you can use that. Um, actively, uh, all our development is, um, is, uh, is public. So if you have any, uh, any interest in joining uh, the development part of the Kubernetes, there is a uh, office hours that uh, runs biweekly on Tuesday noon PST. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, you're more than welcome to join this program. Oops, that's Google Docs. So um, the link I posted here should work. Or you participate in the Slack channel, uh, Kate's Dash Conformance. Uh, there is one more thing I wanted to show you. Uh, is guidelines um, for conformance test development. I think um, I'll have to switch to my OK. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah, all the links are posted on the slides, so you can use it. And I briefly want to also mention um, the work that's being done right now with conformance. We have a GitHub project board uh, where we track all the issues that are uh, conformance related. Uh, if you s see here, um, all the issues that come through triage, um, where we have umbrella issues on tests we want to uh, write. And then when the tests are written, they will go through the standard uh, progress from uh, the tests sit in the backlog. And uh, if somebody reviews the test, um, it goes into the progress. And once the test is reviewed by the SIG as well as conformance tech leads, um, eventually um, the conformance program um, tech leads will review the test, and that will become part of the conformance uh, test suite. Um, you can follow this. This is also publicly available uh, project board. Um, 
and you can see what tests are going to come in your next release if you are interested in running your tests on 116 um, probably this board will give you some indication of uh, what's coming in the for the future so with that um, also I want to thank um, the people who have contributed to Conformance. Um, some of the slides I have used from uh, Aaron Krickenberger fr uh, from last KubeCon. That's pretty much it from me. So any questions? No questions? I covered a lot. I got one. Um, yeah. Could we use this? Hi. Um, these tests, um, we've got a use case not for conformance, but to do canary testing of the clusters. Is there, this seems like it tests everything. Uh, would that be viable? Uh, you mean ET tests or yeah, just we all wanna, the ET tests. We, we want to know what's going. We want to know if there's anything wrong in the cluster before our clients have problems. So we want to run canary tests on the clusters themselves. Um, Other folks have done that. There sure. Are yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't see. Why not? Why not? Actually, we were also thinking about um, see if we can run the upcoming conformance tests up front on the clusters to see if there could be any problems with the. There was a discussion in the previous meeting, the work group meeting. So, any other questions? All right. Thanks for joining.